Welcome back to Metropole Debrief with me, Andira Ganga. When I sit down, it means the panel is already in studio. Dr. Bitanga Demo and Reginald Kazutu ready to give an in-depth analysis of the Big Four agenda. Thank you very much, Dr. Ari and Reginald, for making time. You're Let's welcome. start with food security because it's one of the basic needs, you know. So the government says by 2022, it wants 100% of Kenyan citizens to be food secure. And we've been having a very interesting conversation just before the break. What do you define as food and what is your perspective of food security and culture and diversity comes in and plays a big role into it. But if we're being honest with ourselves, way since independence, food security is a challenge we've been dealing with. Half a century later, the government is still grappling with food security. Where is the discord coming in, Dr. Ari? The problem has been that we have never fully defined what is food. Uh, when you talk about food, most Kenyans think it's maize. But if we see from the areas where we have a lot of stunting, which is northern Kenya, they need fortified foods, meaning that they need to eat potatoes and other things so that they can get a balanced diet. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you talk about food security, is to ensure that everybody, everybody receives the enough calories, enough proteins, so that we don't have stunting. Mm -hmm. Now we have millions of Kenya who are undernourished, and we are talking about food security. So what we need to figure out is how to, to, to provide nutrition to these millions. Nutrition, we have it, but it's not considered as food culturally. It's considered some supplement mm -hmm. or some uh, appetizer before you eat food, okay. which is maize. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have confused even northern Kenya, which was mostly uh, meat, milk, you know, and, and blood, which is rich in terms of proteins uh, that you never used to see people stunting in those areas. Now they are stunting because um, the, the climate has changed. Okay. You, all the cows die and other things. Mm -hmm. But the most important area I thought about security was going to be innovations. What innovations do we do? When the cows die because of drought, there is enough sunshine. And we know in our shops, we have sun-dried beef from mm -hmm. Australia. Yeah. Why don't we take the cows that are dying and dry the beef mm -hmm. so that our people have necessary proteins throughout? Interesting we perspective. Why don't we take advantage of what we have so as to provide for yes. what we do not have? Yes. Reginald, I want to bring you into the conversation at this point. The government, um, I, I don't think it sees things the way Dr. Tari is saying it. Dr. Tari is seeing it from a, a perspective of nutrition, but the government is looking at it from a point of surplus. And that's why we are injecting more money into projects like irrigation schemes and dams. Is this the magic bullet to the food shortage that we continue to face in the country? Um, I, I don't think it's the, the, the magic bullet. I tend to actually agree with, uh, with, with Dr. Tari. Um, when it is shameful that after all these years of independence, your main sector to the economy is re-independent. Um, it, it, it just does not make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's number one. Um, if you look at the past fiscal policies through the budget statement, the allocation to agriculture has not been increasing. Even with the big four, the allocation to agriculture is still one of the lowest allocations in the whole budget. We are spending more on buying missiles and tanks and all those other things. Uh, at the same time, you come and now start talking about food, uh, food, food security. And, 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 and the problem I have with this element of big four and, and with all the other elements of big four, uh, no one in government is telling us how. Mm -hmm. So you'll find they've thrown a figure, create 1,000 agro-processing SME, SME jobs and over 600,000 new jobs. How? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, the, the other problem that we have with the agricultural sector is the problem that it's actually more small scale than large scale. Uh, and they still want to create 1,000 agro-processing SMEs. As much as SMEs are good in growing uh, any economy, but they play a peripheral supporting role to the primary industries. Mm -hmm. But the agricultural sector, I'll give an example, sugar, uh, the, the sugar sector. The reason why Ugandans, South Sudan, uh, Zambians and Zimbabweans produce more sugar uh, per hectare than Kenya is because they don't have small scale farmers. Mm -hmm. They have more large scale farmers. And until we start fixing, going back and fixing the problem, um, but the no problem of having a small scale farmer is tomorrow I'll decide I don't want to grow maize, I want to try tea. Mm -hmm. Next year I wake up and say I don't want to try tea, let me try avocados since the president said we can now sell avocados, everyone cuts their tea, plants avocado trees. Uh, and that's the problem with small scale uh, agriculture. So I, I, I think for us to actually be food secure, some of these things need to be data driven. What data are we using? Uh, which area of the country is best for growing what? Uh, how best do we then channel funds uh, towards those areas to actually grow what is needed in, in, in the country? Um, and, and like what Dr. said, maize is not the only food. Um, we, we talked about how do you add value to whatever we produce mm -hmm. um, so that you can, if we cannot produce sugar, competitively and cheaper, mm -hmm. and it's cheaper for us to import the sugar. Okay. What can we get the guys in Mumias to do better than keeping on forcing them to grow cane? You need to tell them this cane business is not working. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get it cheaper from Uganda, way cheaper. We will never be able to make it cheaper with our structure. Uh, if the soil in Mumias is able to grow wheat, why not then grow, grow wheat? Mm -hmm. um, so that you start utilizing the arable land for the things that one, we are competitively good at, uh, which we can get a value from. Mm -hmm. yes. Allow me to bring let, in the let viewer. Let us clarify this. This is a very important. Go ahead. Because you, journalists, you like to move to another area before we fully clarify. What you say it is very important mm -hmm. in, this, in the sense that uh, we don't look at data. A few years ago in Kitale, we used to do 40 bags per acre. Today, they can hardly do 15. Why the discord? Yeah. It's because we, we have subdivided the land, land is being overutilized, the productivity is going down, nobody is stopping it. And then some small farmers may decide they are not using fertilizer. Uh, so you have an even production, mm -hmm. the productivity is continuously going down. And then we are increasing the area of growing maize. Mm -hmm. That's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. You need the smaller the piece you have, the higher you produce from that small piece so that you, you don't have millions of people into farming. Uh, we have almost 70% of our people into farming. Most countries is 3% which is doing farming and producing for the more than 100% of what the country wants. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to manage production. You can't manage it with millions of producers whom you cannot control. Uh, so we need to begin painfully what is called land consolidation and be able to grow to save our lives in the days to come. So if we don't look at these numbers, we would end up get to, into a point where we are not able to produce. I come from an area where there is no land. The average acre, the average farm size per person is two acres. Mm -hmm. For you to break even, from two acres, from, from uh, to break even, say, tea, you need to have more than two acres. Two acres, you are putting a cow here, a house here, and whatever you plant, mm -hmm. it is the same thing you take that money and bury it or put it in the latrine because you are not going to break even. You are actually killing yourself. That is what is causing poverty. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted food security, we waste 40% of our food. 40% mm -hmm. goes to waste in very many ways. From harvest to the table, we waste 40%. We should have found how do we save this 40%. Number one, we have this where you store the silos and the maize is stolen from the NCPP. We should have closed it and gone for smaller storage facilities 
and they trained Chuakali to manufacture those sh small storage facilities. And that's job creation. And right that's there. job creation. So that you have every three households, they have one silo to store the maize. Then you remove the waste. That 40 percent means we are not going to look for another 200,000 hectares to grow more maize. Uh, it's silly because then we are able to get enough food for the people. Mm -hmm. Then we need to spend money on changing the culture where people can be able to eat certain foods and go to bed. In Western Kenya, I said potatoes are not considered f as food. If they can't eat those food, potatoes, we need to convert them into chapatis so that they can go to bed. So the, the serious problem in, here is in the way we think. Uh, here is the serious problem. Because we don't study our people mm -hmm. over time, what are the changes in the economy? Younger people are not eating ugali, but we are spending all the resources to grow maize. You go and look at the data on wheat. Wheat has moved from less than 500,000 tons to 2 million tons, mm -hmm. meaning most of us are consuming wheat but we are not growing that wheat. Yeah. We imported 1.7 million tons when people are running naked on fields which, which should be grown wheat mm -hmm. and then create jobs in that. So we should actually use data science to make the decisions. So use data to make informed decisions. To make decisions. informed decisions. And that is the only no. way that food security yes, is going to be. Yes, we are not be. going to succeed if we are making up hazard decisions. Great. Now, I'd like to bring in the viewer at this point. And at Abuya Patricia says, please tell us why more money is being pumped into failed irrigation schemes camouflaged in the food security pillar. Now, irrigation in Kenya is a very, is a very, <coughs> it, it, it's a very blurry line. Because we saw Gulana Kulalu, there are allegations that it has failed. We've always had irrigation schemes in the country, but we are not seeing major results from them. However, countries like Israel that are desert by nature have made the most out of irrigation. What do you make out of this? Very quickly before we move to the next pillar. Um, it's not an allegation. Galana failed uh, drastically and sunk billions of, of, of dollars. And I think the same thing no one has been put to account. Mm -hmm. um, we moved on thinking we, we sunk billions to something that failed. Uh, the CS didn't lo lose their job, the PS didn't lose their job, whoever was in charge of that project didn't lose their job. And more money um, is still being pumped. Money is being pumped. The, the problem with the agricultural sector is just not irrigation. You need to mechanize the whole sector. And you cannot mechanize small scale farmers, possess private property. Mm -hmm. When they go large scale, then you're talking about things of combined harvesters, uh, overhead irrigation uh, and all, the, all those things. Um, so the agricultural sector itself is one underfunded and needs to be completely mechanized, um, including even digitizing it. Mm -hmm. um, going back to data, uh, these days you have drones, you can do surveys using drones, you can be able to predict weather uh, weather, pattern, weather patterns. It, it is foolhardy for our weathermen to come and tell us in April that I think the rains are going to, to fail. That's already too late because the seed is already in the ground. Mm -hmm. It's rotting. Uh, by December, the weathermen should have already said, I don't think you're going to have enough rain in April. So if you want to plant, either plant now or push your planting to when the rain, rain comes. Mm -hmm. So it's a mechanization that needs to be done in, in the whole sector. But that mechanization is not going to happen if one, government policy doesn't send funding, mm -hmm. and not just funding, funding plus technical support. Sometimes you wonder why you have AFC, ADC, uh, the Carries, Camrys, Ilries in this country. Um, we wonder what, what are they doing? What is AFC doing? What is a ADC doing? Mm -hmm. It was a bank or institution set up to fund the mechanization of Agriculture. agriculture. But the problem is that we have is that every five years a president wants to be re-elected, they wipe out all the loans for AFC and ADC. Who's holding all the loans for AFC and the ADC? Politicians and members of parliament. And that's how most of them end up owning large tracts of land. So but when we have also to, to clarify this. I think everybody is falling into uh, sexy terminologies like, oh, we are, we are waiting for uh, for rain fed and whatever. Um, the amount of, as I said earlier, the amount of waste, yeah, if we save it, yeah, we may need very little of that rain, of that, 
of that uh, irrigated uh, land. Mm -hmm. Because if, if Kulalu failed, did we, go to, did we do anything different? We, we ate from what we, which we have already yeah. wasted and they started buying other stuff from I hear other you, countries. Terry. So yeah. if we consolidate the waste, then we'll be able to save a lot more in the a value chain more. that can be invested mm. into things like exactly. mechanization of agriculture. Yeah. Let's now move on to the manufacturing sector, which is also a very uh, key sector. The government wants to um, increase its contribution to the GDP uh, by over 15%. Now, this cannot happen unless some things change. One, manufacturers have been complaining about the cost of production in the country. If you compare uh, Kenya to our younger brothers who are catching up with us, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, they're beating us. Investors are going into those countries. And recently, Peter Munya spoke at an event, and this is what he had to say. Listen in. Well, there you have it. Peter Munya saying, uh, companies are setting up in Kenya without reforms. What if the reforms are being introduced? However, there's, there's kind of uh, a fallacy or facade when it comes to what textbook economics and the reality on the ground. The World Bank is of doing business says Kenya is constantly improving. However, is that the reality on the ground for manufacturers and for investors in the Kenyan economy? Let's start with you, Dr. Ari. Well, some things have happened, uh, but I have written several times that we have not disrupted electricity in this country. And uh, the reason why I make that argument is that if, even if what the minister said happens, it's not going to come down. <clears throat> we have not seen as to utilizing God-given resources like sunshine to create green energy. You know, no company has tried. These companies that are looking for cheaper power, their roofs have no solar panels mm -hmm. to even heat the water they, they wash their hands with uh, so that we begin to see actually they need to cut the cost. But what government needed to do in, in this sector, it, it, energy is not the only problem. We have too many problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the counties are bringing their own requirements, they are not responding, no garbage collection, so you are doing everything by yourself. So we, we need a much wider discussion on what is the role of count governments with respect to industrialization, mm -hmm. because they are coming with arbitrary regulations. I know uh, some areas like in, in telecommunications, they want to charge their own in terms of the masts and other things. Um, we need to streamline that. That is where Parliament must come in and stop the counties from also trying to raise money from where the government is ra raising the resources mm -hmm. in order to lower the cost okay. of doing business. Mm -hmm. There are those redundancies which have not been dealt with. But as with respect to energy, energy we need a disruption the same way Ethiopia has done. Mm -hmm. Now we are going to import electricity from Ethiopia because Ethiopia has done, um, one, one dam is producing 6,500 megawatts, megawatts, which is much, much larger, three times more than what the entire Kenya is producing. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to think. Okay. Um, the same thing we did with telecommunications. People used to say, you can't lay fiber because it's too expensive. We can't afford it. Uh, there is this thing, I believe, that if you build it, 
they will come. Okay. If we provided electricity in plenty, investors would come because there is capacity to provide it. You can't tell someone that we are working with a, a variance of, I don't know, a thousand or less than a thousand, and they are looking at investing heavily mm -hmm. in this country. I so we need, we need to move from this small, which is said, small uh, subsistence production of energy to mass production of energy. Mm -hmm. That's how we can become competitive. Reginald, in relation to tax incentives, Rwanda does really well in this. When private investors come into Rwanda, they're given tax rebates. When the business is, is, is attracting foreigners into the country, let's say, for example, in the health sector or the tourism sector, if you're attracting foreigners into the country, which is giving them a forex exchange, you'll get tax incentives. How should we position ourselves in relation to tax incentives so as investors can come in and boost the manufacturing sector? Um, I mean, before I answer that question, I, I think one thing that also uh, policy makers in, in the country need to come to, to terms with and, and the government. Mm -hmm. We need to come to a point where we agree that we are an agricultural economy. 90% of our manufacturing is agro-processing. Unga, cooking oil, sugar, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think to the point where we can reconcile with ourselves that we are an agricultural economy, you will see your manufacturing in that same light. Um, value addition to the agricultural uh, sector. Um, and we also need to be honest with ourselves. Uh, we are, we, there is no way um, Intel is going to come and make chips in Kenya. One, our labor is high, our electricity is high, mm -hmm. um, our taxes are high. Are we ever going to be globally able to compete in terms of labor? No. Ethiopia has beaten us to that. Not even Ethiopia. As in, you can't beat India and China on labor. Completely not possible. Our cost of labor can maybe never be lower than those uh, two countries. We are a bit of years behind in terms of educating and uh, having skills in that area. So if Intel comes, how many IT skills do we have for them to sustain? They will employ half the country, if not all the IT people in the country, to run their factory. So we, we also, as a country, again, um, when we have fragmented uh, policies, and, and, and we mentioned it in the report that we released, sometimes that we, we, our policies and government decisions border Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. Fantasy. Yeah? Uh, if we're actually going to grow this manufacturing sector, it will realize that we are not going to make a car. We can't even make toothpicks. Yeah? The guy walking on the street is walking umbrellas imported from... China, um, toys, plastic toys made in, in China. So our manufacturing sector is 90% agro-processing. Mm -hmm. So the question now is how do you grow that manufacturing Answer sector? Answer the question, how do you grow it? If you want to grow that, you have to go back to where they get their supplies from. Mm -hmm. Grow the agricultural sector, you grow the manufacturing sector. I hear you. If you grow the agricultural sector, Dr. you actually said it, 70% of all employed Kenyans are in the agricultural sector. 64% of all SMEs are in agribusiness. If the income of the factors of production in the agricultural sector increase, yeah, uh, we were told recently agricultural GDP grew by 6.3%. Again, measuring output, you've produced five bags of maize, uh, that's GDP, mm -hmm. but income is not trickling down. So if income for the 70% grow, you increase aggregate demand in the economy. Okay. They will start demanding border borders. Mm -hmm. They will start demanding nice phones. Mm -hmm. So you now create a market for those things. Once you create an environment where there's demand for them, mm -hmm. you also create now the entrepreneurs who are willing to take the risk and invest in industry. Okay. And say, there's demand for phones. Mm -hmm. Let me start a phone uh, manufacturing business. But you don't climb the tree from the top, which is uh, what the government is trying to do. Okay. Make laptops. I'm thinking, okay, but if you made the laptops, who is buying the laptops? Uh -huh. We can't export them because the quality is definitely not going to match. We cannot be comparatively competitive in the international market. Mm -hmm. Do you have enough demand locally to consume those laptops you want to, to produce? I hear you. You don't have it. So I think the first thing, if you want to grow the manufacturing sector, these one million jobs they want to create um, and, and, and this FDI they want to, to, to get, we have to agree that we are an agricultural 
uh, economy, economy and our manufacturing is more agricultural. If we are going to move away from agriculture and manufacturing, it has to be organic. It can't be helicopter money and say, here's money, EPZ, produce this. Okay. It's not going to work. Dr. I, think, uh, I think w we need to reduce the number mm -hmm. of gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this because I've, I've had some investors experience this. There are people in positions who are there as gatekeepers and block some of what so simple. I did an article once. Some companies were refused land. They walked to Ethiopia, they were given land. And these were not in the agricultural sector. So number two is our universities must play a very key role in industrialization. What role do they need to play? They need to begin what we call reverse engineering. This is what created China. There are some things which the patents have expired, mm -hmm. which we can reverse engineer mm -hmm. and they begin to sell. Like some of these toys you see around, we, we could easily create them here. But because everybody flies to China to buy them, it, it's a shame for us that we are doing this. We need to also to look at some of the light electronic industries. This is what we meant to do in Konza, that because China was losing competitiveness and India was looking at that, we said we can actually compete with India by getting into this light manufacturing. But we didn't pay attention. The companies that came with light production of mm -hmm. electronics, okay. they, they could, we couldn't get the land because um, the land, National Land Commission had come in place. They didn't know their mandate. Nobody could ask them to do that. Three or four companies were begging to have land to do production mm -hmm. here. We couldn't do it because so of the uh, too many rules, too us, many oh. king beans we have in all these places, too many middlemen. Um, we need to remove all these middlemen. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we need to help farmers if we have to grow uh, the agro processing industry. We cannot compete with South Africa in terms of eggs in Nairobi because they have developed their supply chain that the farmers, we would have an aggregation point where they would drop their eggs and then these eggs are transported this way and brought to Kenya. Mm -hmm. So an egg from South Africa in Nairobi is cheaper than the egg from Moranga or Kiambu, yeah. which is a walking distance. So consolidate so, the chain. So consolidate, develop that supply chain so that even the person processing the eggs can actually make some money. That's, you don't get into an industry because you are patriotic. Mm -hmm. You get into an industry because to you make want to... money. Uh, and to make money, you know. And this thing of sugar, we have said several, we are not competitive in sugar production. Mm -hmm. Uganda does it at $300 per ton. We are doing at $900 per ton. So if and it's not profitable, we leave let it. go. We leave it or leave it to, to where it's making sense. We allow the small producers, jaggeries, to make that sukari nguru, mm -hmm. which is profitable at that, st at that level, instead of going all the way to make refined and it's sugar. Not make, it's and it's not, not making, making money for both yes. the farmer and the nation. Exactly. We are almost running out of time because this, this is a very passionate conversation that we cannot exhaust in one session. Mm -hmm. But I'd like us now to t touch on housing. 1.5% levy that will be uh, imposed on Kenyans should uh, the petition that was uh, taken to court be thrown out. However, this is a good idea because the government is seeking to provide housing, which is a basic need and it is enshrined in the Kenyan constitution of shelter and sanitation. Mm -hmm. However, the, the, the way the government is seeking to implement it is where so many questions are rising out of it. Good project. How should the government go about it? Uh, I will largely disagree. It's not, it's not a good project. Um, you think I, so? Again, you go back to data. Housing is not affordable in the country, not because people can't afford it, but it has been made unaffordable. One, corruption money goes to create an artificial demand, which has made prices go up. Mm -hmm. Somali pirate money made whatever. South Sudan money flooded the market. If you cannot curb these three, if you cannot curb these three, because where is the government going to build these 500,000 houses? 
assuming I work in Lovington, I work in Lakeshore, then you build me a house in Ati River. No, they have, it's, it's, it's the projects have been marked in different places. They have one, I was there at the site mm. in Gara. Yes, so, so again, you, you are forcing someone to say, go stay in Gara. The house is three million. Average income for a Kenyan is 57,000. Which Kenyan is still going to afford that house for, for, for three million? No, however, the government is saying they're introducing uh, mortgages through the Kenya uh, Mortgage Refinance Company nine that should, should nine, be... Nine percent of three million for 30 years. Do the calculation. So for you, it's not a practical project? You see, the, the problem is where the government is trying to play the role which an economy and the private sector is supposed to do naturally. The government the is private supposed sector, to when the private sector gives you a one bedroom house, it gives you a six point five million Kenyan shillings. The government is giving you at one million. Yes. Why is the private sector giving me a six point five? Because I was corruption money, Somali money, South Sudan money, interest rates, and the ridiculous growth in money supply which we don't know where it's going. Government fixes this, housing prices will go down. Dr. what are your two cents? Me, the, the bone I have with uh, housing is that we don't have a legal framework uh, to proceed at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I recall Umoja was built for the poor. And it was a wonderful idea then. But the rich brought their relatives and held those houses and they started reselling the houses. So we had doing NIMS. We should have done NIMS first, a legal framework, so that the government knows that they are giving this house to Ndemo. Mm. And that is Ndemo. But what's going to happen, some of these flats you are seeing, people will line up their relatives and, uh, and put their names. Even the relative may not even know that mm -hmm. they have been allocated. Yeah. And the two years down the, lo the road, you are being seeing those houses being sold. Those houses should never be sold because they are subsidized using Kenyan people's money. There should be a period like 10 years, there is no selling. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And there is no, if you are not staying in that house, you will lose it. Oh, okay. Then you begin to have the real people who well, are suffering the to get the house. There are too many loopholes um, that are there now that do, the poor people may never actually benefit from that. Among those loopholes is the distribution mechanism of those houses. What do you think? The government says uh, it will be a lottery and then those who will be lucky enough are the people who will get the houses and then they'll have to start paying for the houses. Very briefly. Um, again, like what you said, fragmented police. Someone thinks housing, then they don't think the whole process uh, through. Um, we, we have created this Kenya mortgaging refinancing Company. institution. That institution is just like AFC, ADC, ICDC. If you didn't make these three work, how are you going to make this other one work? Dr. Well, as I said, we need to have tight regulation mm -hmm. rules in that. If you are going to see six months those houses are in the secondary market, then we have not solved the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to fix the problems on the ground and then the cost of housing will drastically go down. So if the issues you've brought out are fixed, then the private sector will be able to give me a one bedroom house at one million Kenya shillings. You see what will happen? You're not just fixing that. If the government focuses on what affects 50-60% of the economy, which is the agricultural sector, directly and indirectly, mm -hmm. the incomes that will increase in the agricultural sector, you'll have people that are actually able to afford to buy these houses. Uh, right now, people can't afford the houses because they're artificially um, priced up. However, Actually, the houses the, are designed uh, for people who make 100,000 no, no, Kenyan shillings. No, no, no. no, no. The, you, you, you know you, you are looking at the end. The biggest problem in housing is land. Yes. Every Kenyan is buying land. We have put pressure on land that it has grown to become like gold, you know? Nobody affords land. So demand has the driven up even the prices if, of even land. Even if you say private sector go and uh, have an acre in Kilelesho is 300 million, there is no way you are going to do it. Actually, so an acre in Ruiru is 128 million in Ruiru. Yes, so, so ask yourself, how are we going to get affordable housing? Yeah. And either um, there has to be a disruption 
in terms of land or capping land, how much land in demo should have, uh, such that others can actually get access to this land. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to manage land in this country, and that's why it has gone beyond and, and, our and, means. And just to add to that. Very briefly, because yes. land is a very touchy just, issue. Just briefly. <coughs> which Kenyan on which salary can afford an acre for 300 million in Lavington with clean money? Okay, good, good, <laughs> yeah, good question. And uh, I think I think this is something that we wait to see how it goes. There's an injunction uh, in court. Let's see how that goes. We're supposed to be speaking to Hinga, and uh, he's been very active in championing for this project. He says the government will be giving uh, private developers land for free to go and develop. So it's it's kind of a wait and see. However, mm -hmm. as we wait and see how housing will turn out, there's the universal health coverage, right? But we need to reconcile quantity health care with quality health care. Just uh, before we came on for the interview, there was the lady who was saying she doesn't feel the impact of UHC because she has cancer and she has to top up for uh, radiotherapy. And we know so many people that have been on this sport. Let's start with you, Reginald. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the problem in uh, that, again, is I, I still go back to policy, government policy. Mm -hmm. If you look at Japan, when they came out of World War II, one thing they were 100% sure of is that they are not going to cre create a welfare state where you dish out health care, dish out education, dish out pension, dish out. They made sure that they grow the economy, they grow the private sector, and the society creates a wealthy society. You pay for your pension, you pay for your health care, you pay for your... And, and Japan doesn't have, uh, the Japan government itself doesn't have a burden of retirement, uh, the Kenyan government has a burden of pension. Uh, now they want to take on the burden of paying for everyone's uh, medical care and, and all. And, and I think it's, it's, it's a wrong way of running a country because mm -hmm. you're creating a welfare uh, state. Everyone knows that I don't need to do anything. I'll get free health care. Okay. When I get to 60, I'll get my 5,000 every month. That, that, that's that's just, just sinking the country. Doctor, very briefly as we wind up. Yes, I, what I would say is that when Roosevelt changed the U.S., when there was, after the Depression, uh, it is the legal framework that went first. Now, we are getting into UHC without a legal framework. NHIF has a lot of discretion, so some people are benefiting more than others. and. And that's why you are seeing so many cases from NHIF. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to send you to India so mm -hmm. that they make money from that India trip. That's not the way we can achieve universal health care. Mm -hmm. We needed to have a legal framework to protect uh, all these discretions that NHIF has, which in the next two, three years, okay. they will not have any money for anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As we wind up, the final question, what are some of the key indicators by 2022 that will pinpoint us towards a direction that will show Kenyans that we have come to the realization of the Big Four agenda? Very briefly, 30 seconds each. Reginald? Unfortunately, if you look at the, the document, there is no how, mm -hmm. there is no how to measure it. Yeah. There's a lot of statistics that have been just thrown there. Um, we've not been able to create jobs in the last seven years yeah all of a sudden you want to create 2.9 formal sector jobs in in three years mm -hmm. we all know how that is going to pan out those jobs will all be created in the informal sector mm -hmm. uh to to meet the target so again it's it's a good project which is not really that measurable okay um the, the government has been since this has been launched it's been two years mm -hmm. Um, by now they should be giving us a progress report okay. on health care, we have reached here. On food security, we have reached here. But if you hear all the talk that is happening, even this year, it's like it's being launched again this year. Mm -hmm. So trust you in 2022, nothing would have been so done. So big talk, no tangible project. No, no tangible. tangible. Dr. If, if, if I ever were advising the president, I mean, I would go to the delivery team mm -hmm. and say, close down NCPP on, on food. Number two, get to Israel or whatever, collaborate, begin to manufacture small silos, provide 
uh, small, I mean, they need to produce like 10 or 100 so that our local people understand how to manufacture it. So that the whole country will be dotted with those silos. That is what people would see and they say, this is a legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If you leave it this way, you will get to 2022 and you will be still reading in the newspapers, NCPP brought maize from Mexico, it was bad, it was thrown away. Then you go to health. Mm -hmm. One week, this, is, this, is, this has been achieved in the US. We need a legal framework, uh, housing. We need a legal framework to protect, to, to, to close all the loopholes that we have in this, so that everybody feels satisfied that what you got is what I get, because that is what the government is giving, then progressively begin to improve that as we move forward. Mm -hmm. You cannot do it on, on the word let go. So 2022, then we can say, President Uhuru, Uhuru laid the foundation of this. And you can see what has happened, you know. We have this many industries uh, from agro-processing. Then politicians mm -hmm. must stop investing, uh -huh. investing in the very same area we want the small enterprises to invest streamline the supply chains in agricultural sector mm -hmm. so that you can save the small farmer, remove the middleman, and be able to provide enough margins for producers to produce locally. Then you introduce tariffs, which Trump is using against China, China. so that you protect the local manufacturers. Two points, yes. gentlemen. Yeah. One, proper legal framework on the ground. Two, yeah. respect the fact that Kenya's economy is driven by agriculture. The moment the government comes to that realization, then the big foray come 2022 will be a success. Come 2022 with no legal structure and we don't respect the agriculture sector by cutting down waste and investing the money that could have been reinvested in the sector somewhere else, then the big four will just have been another re-election strategy by President Huru Kenyatta that becomes another white elephant project. Reginald uh, Kadzutu, thank you for making time. Yeah, Doctor, okay. thank you for making time. Thank we you. went now to walk onto our set because we are very tight of time and take a look at what you are saying on set. Sorry, forgive me about that. We want to uh, take a look at what you're saying on Twitter, Joe. I don't know if you can help me. Okay, there you go. We want to take now a short commercial break as we fix a couple of things right here. When we come back, we take a look at Twitter very briefly and after that, we wrap up the show. Stay with Metropole TV. Okay. Okay, um, uh, yeah, we are facing a little bit of technical hitches here and there. We want to take a look at Twitter. Where are we at? Okay, Dan O'Kari says, what action has the government taken in boosting healthcare? And if any, why has some failed to witness in Kerugoya Hospital? Let's take a look at another tweet here. At Abuya Patricia says, Kenya will only be food secure when we start treating our farmers with dignity by providing seeds, fertilizer at subsidized price, and a market for their grain. Cherry Shetali, one of our very own, since the children are the future, how should a child participate in fulfilling the role of the Big Four agenda, especially in food security in counties such as Turkana? Let's take a look at this. Tivin Joera says, is affordable housing a pillar on the Big Four agenda sustainable? We've been talking about that. Abuya Patricia once again, how come a desert like Israel is food secure and Kenya with tons of arable land is not? Let's take a look at what Kevin Kabuya says. Why does it seem like the Jubilee administration does not have an idea of the implementation process of any of the four pillars? They seem to be in a rush, more of a pick and leave attitude. That's Kabuya right there. Let's take a look at Miss Kinyanju. She says, the current administration has three years left. It's time to take stock. The Big Four agenda. How much has been accomplished? Good question right there, Miss Kinyanju. Let's take a look at Kipto Emmanuel. Is the Big Four agenda targeting real-time development? Emma, it's just another re-election strategy the Jubilee administration sold to Kenyans and is struggling to keep up. Let's take a look at what Anode is saying. Anode Obi is saying, Will the Big Four agenda be realized with the corruption that we do have within our country? These are just some of the um, uh, reactions that this topic is eliciting online. Mwende Mati says, food security is a, is a silent yet persuasive matter in this country. Yet the dictates of nutrition and food security continue to be interestingly unexplored. How can 
how critically are matters of food security being treated before 2022 elapses? My director can help me click on the next. Atabuya Patricia once again says, please tell us why more money is being pumped into failed irrigation schemes camouflaged in the food security pillar. We can take three more. Cherry Shetale once again. The fact that there is no clear regulation on who is entitled to affordable housing is still a matter of great concern. Um, do we say the Big Four agenda has been a success or a failure at this stage? Keep to Emmanuel, what next after the Big Four come 2022? Is there a continuity plan or is it a dead end? Well, he was saying for more of this, watch our show live. Tracy Nyaga says corruption will be one of the major stumbling blocks towards the realization of Big Four. To the crooked, it is a cash cow to milk a lot of reaction you guys tm party 10 says what's the future of the big four agenda beyond president uhuru kenyatta's tenure you know we had vision 2030 africa 2063 and very many other the big four agenda includes food security glana kulalu project did not provide lasting solutions to food security millions allocated why let's take a look at uh we've already sampled this so uh we want to say a big thank you to all of you who took your time to um to watch Metropole Debrief today on behalf of our guests, Dr. Bitangendemo and Reginald Kadzutu, we'd like to say thank you. Our technical team, we've had technical hitches here and there, but that's how it is. That's how life it is. Challenges are part of life, but overcoming them makes life interesting. And we have overcome, and that's why we are coming to the end of this show. Sam Tobiko, thank you for being a great member of the team. Who else is on the team? Mulika Musamed, thank you very much. And the data team, we have John Kibebo and Kade. They're the people who send us data so that we can give you informed information backed with data. On behalf of every other person in the team, our director, Audi, our producer, Stephen Gitao, would like to say thank you for watching the hashtag Metropole Debrief at Ndiro Ganga at Metropole TV KE. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. I'm Ndiro Ganga and I'm in business. Case closed. Good night.